listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. B-cell maturation antigen-targeted therapies exploit a unique mark for treating multiple myeloma and are becoming increasingly utilized in practice. What do managed care pharmacists need to know about these agents? Hello, and welcome to PTCE's Pharmacy Connect, a podcast focused on continuing education created by pharmacists for pharmacists. PTCE is the leader in pharmacy and managed care education. In these episodes, listeners will be presented with the most recent clinical updates and strategies. And now, here's our host and founder of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, Todd Yuri. Pharmacy Times Continuing Education, PTCE listeners, welcome back. This is the PTCE Pharmacy Connect podcast. We are proud to be part of this, bringing audio education and continuing education through podcasting. Boy, I tell you what, 10 years ago when we were just starting out, who would have thought we'd be able to really help pharmacists educating other pharmacists? This is exciting. Please give us some feedback on these recordings. Reach out to the PTCE Pharmacy Connect teams. You can actually find all of their podcasts in their libraries at PTCE Pharmacy Connect. So we have a really interesting continuation of a conversation. We're going to continue the conversation of exploring B-cell maturation antigen, BCMA, uh, targeted therapies and managed care considerations for patients with multiple myeloma. And we have uh, two experts with us here today, both my favorite providers, uh, pharmacists. Hey, I'd like to introduce our faculty for today's podcast. We have Dr. Joseph Kalis, PharmD. He's an ambulatory oncology pharmacist at UC Health, hematology, oncology in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And we have Dr. Scott Sefci, PharmD, who is Director of Pharmacy C- Cancer Care and Assistant Professor of Pharmacy at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So I'm going to start things off with Joe. Could you provide us with a brief overview of multiple myeloma and how many patients it affects? Absolutely. So kind of at its, its core level, multiple myeloma is a disorder of the fully mature plasma cells or or B lymphocytes. It it is roughly less than 2% of all hematologic malignancies, but the American Cancer Society estimated that in 2021, we'd have nearly 35,000 new patients be diagnosed. And if running the numbers, it works out to be about a a 1 in 132 lifetime risk for the, the typical person out there. But I know in, in my practice, I'm seeing an uptick in rates, I think, due to, to better diagnostics and, and better reporting. Just curious if you're seeing the same thing out in Rochester, Scott. Yeah. And, you know, it, myeloma is an interesting disease because of all of the treatment options we've gotten recently. It's created a complexity in how we are approaching these patients, where we're going with them. Um, and, and I think to your point, yeah, I, again, I'm going to have to tell you, we're, we're, we're a little bit, we get a lot of referrals here. Uh, and so we're a referral center. So sometimes what we see is a little warped compared to what everybody else sees. But I would agree with you. I think with the new diagnostic processes, we're starting to see an uptick just like everyone else. Really with that plethora of agents that are available and ones that are being released, I mean, we see an average of 65 months progression-free survival in our first-line patients, but we do know that clinically, patients are going to relapse, they're going to progress on disease, and there's really a true need for continued development of new agents, new drug targets. Yeah, and again, if you look at, if you look at all of multiple myeloma lines of therapy, a qu- almost a quarter of patients will end up at fourth or fifth line type therapy, which is you know unusual for a lot of different types of cancer. So this is one where there are a lot of options, but those options keep progressing and it gets more complicated as you go down the line. So would you kind of speak to how BCMA may be used as a tool for prognosis and treatment response and the advancements that you've seen over the years? Yeah, certainly. I mean, it is part of the title of the podcast to do we get to it. <laughs> Uh, but BCMA, B-cell maturation antigen, um, for those, those out there listening, just think about BCMA as being a cell surface protein. And it, it gets expressed on normal B lymphocytes, normal plasma cells. 
But the key feature of it is that there's little to no expression of BCMA on memory B cells or even on cells that are not B lymphocytes. And for our purposes, it does get quite overexpressed on myeloma cells. So it's a very an attractive target for drug development as we're seeing new agents come out and be released. But where this comes in as a tool for prognosis or as treatment is that we can actually measure the BCMA levels in a patient's serum, or serum BCMA is how you may come across it in the literature if you do some reading after the program today. Um, but in terms of a serum BCMA as a biomarker, how a lot of us may be familiar with using M protein to monitor disease status or disease progression. So really that's the monoclonal protein that the myeloma cells are producing. And it's been an effective tool over the years, but the challenge with it is the, the half-life of the M protein, how long it sticks around in the, the plasma is on the order of days. Now, serum BCMA half-life is actually on the order of hours. So it's, it can be a much more sensitive marker to indicate a disease progression or indicate a time when a change in therapy may be necessary. Now at the moment, Serum BCMA has not yet been validated for a survival benefit. Um, routine serum BCMA monitoring is not generally happening outside of a clinical trial setting right now, but I do foresee a role where we could be utilizing serum BCMA more in clinical practice as the science advances and as we accumulate more data. I know here at my center at UC Health, it's not a routine part of practice right now, and we've had some discussions about perhaps evaluating serum BCMA levels prior to CAR T cell therapy if a patient has had another BCMA directed drug. Anything different out in Rochester, Scott? No, same thing here. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's part of the clinical trial system here. You know, we're, we're looking at it same, pretty much the same as you. What, what, what I always remind our residents about is that you know, the most expensive drug in the world is the one that doesn't work. So anything that helps us guide our, our therapy choices are how long do we stay with a drug? Any of those kind of things are very, very beneficial. So I, I, I'm very curious how this ultimately comes out uh, and, and plays out in clinical practice. Uh, but right now, I still, I'm like you, I think it's still in that experimental clinical trial kind of stage. Uh, we're not real sure what to do with the results once we get them, those kind of things. What about the treatment options for patients with multiple myeloma? Uh, oh, and, and that too. Certainly, certainly. And with, with regards to BCMA-directed therapies, we've actually got a couple of classes of drugs, different mechanisms of how they'll work, but all centered around that target of BCMA. I'd say the most prevalent drug in this area, most prevalent treatment option that, that many of us may be familiar with is an antibody drug construct entitled uh, belantamab mafodotin. So we've got a, a monoclonal antibody that targets BCMA. Now, the way I explain it to patients and students and residents is a lot like the lock on your front door at home or the lock on your car. And you've got a key, which is the protein. You've got the lock, which is the receptor or rather the antibody. So they'll attach to each other. That opens the lock, allows the drug into the myeloma cell. Um, but with belantamab, it's going to be attaching to that cell surface protein of BCMA and then depositing a chemotherapy payload directly into the cell of interest or the myeloma cell in our cases. For other, other types of therapies, other types of treatments here, um, we do have bispecific antibody treatments. And if you picture a monoclonal antibody, and I'll ask patients or, or learners to, to picture it almost like the wishbone from a Thanksgiving turkey. And that Y shape in the wishbone is where your target of interest would bind to. But for, for these bispecific antibodies, think here about we've got one component that'll attach to BCMA, and then a second component that'll often attach to antigens like CD3 on a T cell. So these are intended to act almost like a, a physical bridge or link directly between the T cells of the immune system and, and myeloma cells. There are several drugs available in this class currently. 
Uh, many of them are still under development um, with different targets aside from BCMA, but just in terms of listing these, we've got Talquetamab, Teclistamab, Savostamab. So again, think, think MAB at the end will be our monoclonal antibody handle. Curious to see how these fit into treatment sequencing as we discuss side effects and costs and prices, especially with some of the manufacturing difficulties we've run into with our, our final class of therapy, or rather here, the, the CAR T cells. So CAR here standing for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. My wife's a pharmacist, so we have some fun dinner table discussions. And you know, when the six-year-old asks about cars, he's like, well, why are you talking about Matchbox cars at home? I'm like, oh, very different, but maybe there's an analogy there I can spin somewhere. Uh, but with, with the chimeric antigen receptor T cells, CAR T cells for short, we're, we're taking the patient's own autologous cells and essentially programming them to express a receptor for the target of interest, whether that be BCMA or other antigens. Uh, can be an effective source of therapy. And we've got some two approved agents now, Idacabtagene Beclusal and Siltacabtagene Autolusal. Um, but we've seen some very encouraging response rates in practice, um, even things up to as far as MRD negativity, some minimal residual disease. And the lower MRD is, the better response we're getting. But a very exciting and encouraging um, class of targeted agents, especially with the three different directions we just reviewed. I, I think the encouraging thing here is, is there's a lot of options coming and there's a lot of opportunities and how we put this all together is still going to be a mystery. Uh, you know, we still have the bi-specifics have not been released yet, uh, but it's going to be very intriguing to see how we sequence all of this, how we put this all together and how it integrates with all of the current multiple myeloma therapies. Uh, I, I think it's a fun time to be a pharmacist because of the different opportunities that are out there. Uh, and then, you know, somebody like me who works on the administrative side, it's a fun time to be looking at, at this because all of the cost containment issues and how are we going to manage this and how are we going to get all of this in our budget? All of this starts raising all these kind of questions. Uh, and, and we have a few hints, but no direct specific answers at this point in time. So, Joe, where do you see the antibody therapies fitting into the current treatment sequencing? I think that is one of our million dollar questions, pun intended on the cost of these agents. But the, the bi-specific antibodies, I think, really pose some, some interesting questions in terms of we're we're so far seeing some very encouraging response rates. You, you could try to compare them with the response rates from CAR T cells and then looking at similar side effect profiles between bi-specific antibodies and CAR T cells. But where I'm, I'm seeing the sequencing come in a bit, even now in, in practice, is with the CAR T cells, there, there is that manufacturing component of having to freeze off the patient's own autologous cells, send them to be engineered. So I know in our practice here in Colorado, we've actually got more patients who are needing therapy than there are manufacturing slots available. So I'm having to try and stratify those who would be most appropriate to receive, say, expedited CAR T cells. But, but for the bispecific antibody therapies, I could really see those perhaps fitting in for certain patients ahead of CAR T cell therapy, just by virtue of being an off-the-shelf option. And once the drug has been developed and released, it's something that could be uh, deployed right away. Yeah, but Joe, that th throws in an interesting question, right? These drugs have similar side effects. So if you've given somebody a bispecific, they had significant cytokine release syndrome, do you really want to put that person through CAR T therapy? And what does that look like? And then you've got BMT out there somewhere. Where does this all fit? Is it before or after CAR T? I, again, I think these are all of the questions we're still going to have to hammer out over the next several years. Oh, e exactly. Because with the CAR T cells, we see... Uh, the cytokine release syndrome or CRS is one of the REMS program requirements centered around those agents and need to have medications available, tocilizumab for one on hand if you're giving these agents. And I think we're going to need more to more data, more time development. But I'm curious to see if we do see sequencing trials or if 
as in earlier phases of myeloma, we're trying to piece some of that together ad hoc from the studies that are out there. What are the current challenges associated with utilizing BCMA-directed ADCs um, in practice? The lantamab is unique in that it actually can have some ocular toxicities. So the way the drug is working, the mafidotin component can, can penetrate into the corneal epithelial tissues within the eye. And then as it affects the cell life cycle there, can ultimately progress to keratopathy or even visual changes. Um, so in hearkening back to our REMS discussion a moment ago on the CAR T cells, um, Belantamab actually does have a REMS program associated with these ocular toxicities. Um, so patients are required to undergo ophthalmologic exams prior to beginning therapy, uh, prior to each cycle, and cycles are every three weeks. And then we could see dose delays or dose modifications based on if these ocular toxicities and keratopathy or vision changes are occurring. But it is yet another visit for a patient to go to, another set of things for clinicians to monitor for. And then I'd say as well, there are still some cytopenias, thrombocytopenia with belantamab. If we've got a patient with progressive disease or myelosuppression happening, that could be another barrier to use. Yeah, and again, it's 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 a drug that you can't just decide today that we're going to use, and and it it, it causes sometimes a paradigm shift in your clinical practices. So you got to do a little bit of more planning. You got to do a little bit more thinking, uh, and as Joe said, you got to you got to get the patient involved with this multiple providers across a process. And coming back to that patient perspective as well, you know, as, as someone who's counseling patients directly, I'll see this every single day. But with belantamab, patients are, are asked to instill eye drops multiple times a day to prevent dry eye and keep that corneal epithelium lubricated, try and mitigate some of these toxicities. So it's yet another step that we're, we're asking patients to do and to take on. And then you got the whole manufacturing process and, you know, the time that that whole process takes. So again, it's something that the patients have to understand. It, it's, it's changing the way therapy is. You gotta, you gotta walk through all the different steps before you're gonna get the drug safely and effectively. One of my, one of my mentors back in residency really hit, hit home with the phrase in this one is that treatment is not a milkshake. You know, we can't just pull it up at a window and have someone take it and drive away, like you said, same day. Could you tell us about the challenges with these therapies and how you'd address them? Actually, we do outpatient therapy um, with CAR T. We we try to keep them outpatient as long as we can. Um, but to your point, inevitably, uh, I, I think I can, we can count on one hand the number of patients that's gone completely outpatient. Uh, inevitably, they get admitted to the hospital for uh, the cytokine release management, uh, and so uh, we try to keep it as outpatient as much as we can because. In our mind, it's it's trying to overcome that final challenge, and that final challenge is the cost of these drugs. Uh, and it's you know it's one of those things that you have to look at how you're going to mitigate that cost to the best of your ability. And the more we can do outpatient, the cheaper it is in the long run. Right, and especially with the the multifaceted aspects of CAR T, we're not looking at just the cost of the drug, but also the potential cost of tocilizumab or other therapies to manage cytokine release syndrome, or even you know, the hospitalizations that you mentioned. Yeah, there's particularly the ICU stay, right? But if somebody ends up in an ICU for multiple days, then, then your cost skyrockets. So yeah, th managing those kind of things are, are very, very important. Scott and Joe, as pharmacists, your primary role is safety and clinical knowledge about these medications and treatments, but there's so much more happening today in the, the management of medication treatments and how pharmacists are helping. And one of that, um, one of those aspects is, you just mentioned the, the cost, Scott, in, in the managed care side of this. So we'd like to discuss the managed care considerations for BCMA targeted therapies. Um, Scott, can you please describe the economic burden of multiple myeloma and the impact it has on patients? Yeah, so myeloma is one of the most costly cancers that we have out there, or at least from a treatment perspective. Um, when, you, when you look at what's been published in the literature as far as the cost burden uh, prior to CAR T cell therapy, so 
uh, in 2018, there was a publication that looked at the cost of the burden. And over a, you know, about a 20 month period of time, you're looking at 300 to $400,000 worth of cost, uh, about 300,000 dev uh, devoted directly to the disease related costs. And, you know, almost 400,000 if you take in all costs that the patient goes through. And these costs change over time. Uh, if a patient has uh, first line therapy without progression uh, compared to by the time they get out to fourth line therapy, uh, the cost uh, goes up incrementally over each line of therapy, particularly as you throw in bone marrow transplant. Transplant up until CAR T cell was the big cost driver in this area. Um, so one of the things is looking at how do we keep people uh, from progressing for as long as we can, because that minimizes the overall total cost. Uh, when you break it down into a pre-diagnostic phase, initial phase, uh, it's our continuing care type phase. And then uh, where we see the big jump in cost is in the terminal phase. Uh, we spend a lot of money at the end of life in the United States for basically all types of cancer. So basically what we're trying to do is minimize the total cost of care throughout the total type of therapy. Uh, and so uh, this is where we look at things like, you know, picking the right drug at the right time. Do we have a drug that we know is going to work? Can we utilize it and gain the most uh, efficacy from it? Uh, and then how do we minimize the adverse events? As we talked about, uh, hospitalization, CRS management, those kind of things are not necessarily cheap. So a goal from a managed care perspective is looking at the right drug for the right patient at the right time. And it, again, it's kind of fun, right? That's basic pharmacy practice. It's right drug, right time, right patient. And so it's one of the things we're constantly looking at as you're trying to evolve therapy for multiple myeloma. Scott, I think of the other aspect of follow-up and treatment in the possibility of adverse events. And I want to know a little bit more about that. How do adverse events in the management of adverse events impact the cost of drugs, especially with BCMA uh, targeted agents? Yeah, it's, it, it adds to the overall cost of care, particularly because most of these drugs have some unique aspect, right? The ocular toxicity and the added cost for ophthalmological exams. Uh, and then when you get over into CAR T and then perhaps the bispecifics as they come out, the CRS management, uh, you're looking at using expensive drugs like tocolizumab for treatment. And then most of these patients end up in hospitalizations. And then, you know, as Joe can tell you from a clinical perspective, then something like tocolizumab goes on shortage and you're like, okay, now we got all these other expensive drugs we got to figure out how to use and what sequencing we can do with. So, you know, on the clinical side, managing those uh, adverse events are very, very important. Even too, like thinking of, of the CAR T-cell products and like the prolonged cytopenias, then you can get into considerations of are we looking at colony stimulating factors to try and manage neutropenia. So the survival of patients with multiple myeloma has improved, which is absolutely terrific. But I want to talk about the overall cost and care, the cost effectiveness of the therapy. Can you expand upon that, Scott? Uh, yeah. So one of the one of the things I'm teaching my residents and trainees is, is we need to look at the value of care. And we define value at Mayo Clinic as outcomes plus safety plus service divided by cost. And so if you think about that, that's starting to look at cost effectiveness and how do you build around cost effectiveness. Um, th the good thing about the BCMA targets is we do have data on cost effectiveness. Uh, the Institute for Cost Effectiveness Research, ICER, has actually developed uh, some reports on BCMA type therapy. Uh, and when, and what they basically found in a nutshell was that the, uh, CAR T cell therapies were not cost effective at any level with the current response rates. And I'm, and I'm going to be saying that right now, and I'm going to want to hear Joe's opinion in a few minutes, because right now we have a response rate of these therapies, but as we get longer term outcomes, Going back to our value equation, the outcomes increase, it makes the cost effectiveness and the value go up. So, you know, are we going to have to continually rerun these models to see what they look like? Um, 
Icer, however, did did find that belantamab was cost effective, even at the hundred thousand dollar per year of life uh, saved or quality adjusted life year saved. Um, it was effective, and so it's it's an interesting dichotomy here. We have a drug that may be more effective than the CAR T cell therapy. So how do we put them in sequence? We don't know yet where the biospecifics are gonna fall in this whole process. A lot of it's gonna depend upon what do their initial outcomes show? And then what is the total cost of therapy? And when I say total cost of therapy, we have to look at it. If we get the same outcome as CAR T, but CAR T is only a one-time cost and then you're done, Versus the bispecifics, which may be, you know, a continuation of therapy. We don't know how long until progression. We got to add all of that up and look and see how all that compares. So it's an interesting world we live in. You know, we do have some early data, but I think it's going to continue to grow and evolve as more and more of these products come out and more of the data comes out over long term. Joe, yeah. you agree? Oh, 100%. Especially with what we're seeing even now with some of the recently released data with the CAR T cells. So if Ida cell or Ida captagene, you know, initial response rates, you're looking in low 70%, depending on the phase of the study data you review. But with um, Silta cell, Silta captagene, we saw an overall response rate around 98% in that initial study. And kind of with the advent of MRD, or minimal residual disease and myeloma, essentially the concept is the less disease that's left, perhaps the longer outcomes, longer term outcomes we'll see. So I think right now the data are still pretty early for our patients who have had CAR T cells. But I think over the coming three to five years, as we get those longer term outcomes, coming back to what you had said, Scott, okay, yeah, high upfront cost. But if we're seeing survival outcomes in the order of months to years and beyond, I think that'll really shift the paradigm. Scott, you mentioned the ICER report. So ICER has done a report on BCMA agents and wondering what what did they find out about the CAR T cell products from a cost effectiveness perspective? Yeah, they run they ran multiple models and basically what they were finding is that they're in the neighborhood of about three hundred thousand uh, dollars per quality adjusted life year which is several times higher than, you know, that 100 to 150,000 that most people use as the threshold. Uh, and so when they ran, I, I like what ICER does because when, one of the things ICER does is they go back and they kind of do it in reverse. And they said, what would this product have to cost to get to that acceptable quality threshold? And, and basically the CAR T cells would, would, would almost, not quite, but almost have to be cut in half in price um, before they re reach that cost effectiveness threshold. So what I'm going to be curious about is as competitors come out, do the company start trying to reach that threshold to say, okay, we want to be cost effective? Or, you know, if we really run the data later and we see, okay, now the number has increased a little bit, do they still try to achieve that cost effective threshold? Uh, as more and more competition in this market comes out. Scott, what about the strategies that payers and health systems can use to manage the economic impact of these BCMA agents? I, I think in my mind, the biggest one is going to be the sequencing. Uh, and Joe and I have already kind of talked about this a little bit, is, is how do you put these pattern, this pattern together and in what order do you put all of these products together to get the longest outcome? Because from a cost effectiveness perspective, if we increase the outcome, that's where we should be driving. And then the rest should be kind of uh, coming together. Uh, so maximizing those outcomes is something we really want to focus on. I think the other big thing is going to be where do we treat these patients? So we treat them as outpatients versus inpatients. That whole site of care can drive cost. Um, and, and are we going to get to a point where we choose one product or one class because they can predominantly be given as outpatients versus another one ends up being predominantly as an inpatient? Something we'll have to look at. Uh, and then the last thing is adverse event management. If you, if you can figure out how to 
keep people out of the hospital, keep them uh, in, in the community. I think in the long run, you're going to be better. Joe, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think the adverse events, they're a key thing for me, just seeing patients progressing through four, five, six, or more lines of therapy. And I've seen a number of cases where we've had cumulative toxicities, like say a patient developed neuropathy from first line therapy, and that has shifted what we can and cannot use later line. And we've talked about some unique toxicities, such as ocular toxicities and cytokine release syndrome. I think you made a great point earlier in that if the patient had significant CRS to a bispecific antibody, are we really going to look seriously at a CAR T cell? But I think a lot of it comes down to each individual patient, individual drugs, and side effects. And again, I'm going to come back to the sequencing because not only do we have the BCMA agents, we have the other myeloma therapies that are out there. We have bone marrow transplant. It's how do you put this overall package together? Um, I'm hoping someone out there does studies that start looking at sequencing to try to help us identify what's the best pattern, the best sequence to put these in. Um, it's not something we typically see, but I think we're going to need it in this type, in, in this disease state at some point in time. It's going to be a pharmacist that does it. I know it. <laughs> you're, you, you're amazing people. Uh, Dr. Kalis, Dr. Sufji, it's been awesome to uh, listen to you uh, discuss together and the importance of this. Uh, we do want to ask one more question, both of you, for our listeners. What would you say is the single most important takeaway for our pharmacists listening in today? Let's start with Scott. Um, I, again, I think we're still early with BCMA, and I think the important part for pharmacists is we have to pay attention to what's coming, what the data is going to show, and how these products are going to fit into therapy. Um, it, you know, this the, it, it's, it's fun to do this talk now. I think we're going to need to repeat this talk in a year or two years to see how everything's began to slot together and what we're doing at this at that point in time. So pharmacists pay attention because these drugs are going to be very, very popular, very hot topics and something you're going to really need to know about. Joe, what about you? Uh, for me, I'd say look at these new therapies that are coming out and their pros and cons kind of from the eyes of the patient to keep that patient perspective in the picture. A little bit of unintentional alliteration there, but more so we've got a lot, again, a lot of visits, a lot of potential side effects. If there's a therapy that we can get that has low side effect risk, great results, and makes patients' lives easier, I think that's the direction I'd love to see things go. Listeners, the simplistic is data, data, data. As much, as much documentation that you can be doing as these uh, treatments move forward because it's pharmacists that are gonna bring it back to continuing research and continuing um, uh, application that's gonna make the most sense. So we're so excited that we get to do these uh, podcasts with the leading pharmacist within our healthcare system. And um, Scott and Joe, you've been absolutely amazing. So I thank you for, you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, pleasure to be here. You were listening to the PTCE Pharmacy Connect podcast. For all of your continuing education needs, please look up the PTCE podcast directory. Go to pharmacytimes.org. And as always, we thank you so much for what you do as pharmacists, our favorite providers. We thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Thanks for tuning in to the PTCE Pharmacy Connect podcast. Your feedback is important to us. Please share with us your thoughts on this episode and other topics you'd like to learn about. Go to pharmacytimes.org forward slash contact and send us a message.